Well, we're here. We've come to our last study in the last book of the Bible. Today on Through the Bible, our five-year journey through the whole Word of God is coming to an end. And as we take this final look at the marvelous book of Revelation, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, our teacher, reminds us that the purpose of this entire study is to glorify Jesus Christ, the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the centerpiece of Revelation, the centerpiece of the entire Bible. Our final study will be in Revelation 22, verses 2 to 21. And as you find your place on the Bible bus, I want to finish something from yesterday. If you were with us, you'll remember I told you about Dr. William Anderson, Dr. McGee's pastor during his seminary years, a man who greatly influenced Dr. McGee's willingness to teach and later be on the radio. Dr. Anderson also loved to talk about prophecy and the joys of heaven. Early in Dr. McGee's third year as a student at Dallas Seminary, Dr. Anderson unexpectedly died at the age of 46. Dr. McGee remembered this quote from Dr. Anderson's memorial service. Here was a man who identified himself everywhere openly with this book in his hand as one who sincerely and candidly believed the scripture to be true. His trust was in God. His confidence was in the word. His expectation was in the promises, and so he looked for the coming of the Lord, eagerly searching the skyline for any sign of his coming, and loved his appearing. These things he taught here, you heard them, you believed them, you rejoiced in them, now they're yours, treasured in your hearts by faith. Well, Dr. McGee heard them, believed them, and rejoiced in them, and now, finishing this five-year series, he would say to us today, now they are yours. Treasure God's Word in your hearts by faith. Today, as we conclude our Bible bus journey, and then tomorrow as we begin anew once again, let's remember that this treasure is ours, and we study and believe it by faith. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, bless your Word as it goes out into all the world today. We believe it, we rejoice in it, and treasure it in our hearts. We proclaim it with great confidence in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, we were in the 22nd chapter. We would just gotten into it. And here we have come to verse 2. And it reads, In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Now, In the New Jerusalem, there is this river of the water of life, and the throne of God is its living fountain supplying an abundance of water. And the tree of life is a fruit tree, as we indicated, bearing 12 kinds of fruit. And it would seem that man in eternity will return back to the diet that he had in the Garden of Eden. In Genesis 1, 29 and 30, we're told, And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat, and to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to every thing that creepeth upon the earth when there is life. I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. Now, the twelve kinds of fruit would seem to suggest a varied diet. And there is a tendency to want to spiritualize all of this here and compare it to the fruits of the Spirit. Well, I have no objection to that personally. I rather would take that viewpoint myself, provided we hold to the literal interpretation, which I think you can do through this section here, although it does seem highly symbolic. I think that we're dealing with that which is quite literal, for we're still talking about heaven. Now, we're told the leaves of the tree are beneficial. They have a medicinal value. Now, why is healing needed in a perfect universe is a very good question. And I would say it's a difficult problem to solve. I have made the suggestion that it's a sort of a first aid kit, which demonstrates the old adage, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound a cure. In other words, here is this first aid kit. And I personally believe that the bodies of the earth dwellers in eternity will be different than the bodies of the believers in the church who are to be like Christ. 
that is their bodies, will be like his. And I would say that the bodies of the earth dwellers may need renewing from time to time. In other words, that may be the reason they come up not only to worship, but to be renewed, certainly spiritually. And I take this as a first aid kit here. At least the prevention is there, but the possibility of sin entering is just not there. Now we are told here that definite thing, there shall be no curse anymore, and the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be therein, and his servant shall do him service, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. All there shall be night no more, and they need no light of lamp, neither light of sun, for the Lord God shall give them light. They shall reign forever and ever. Now, the first creation was blighted by the curse of sin, and this old earth on which you and I live today bears many scar marks of the curse of sin. The new creation will never be marred by sin. Sin will never be permitted to enter even potentially. You see, it was potentially in the Garden of Eden in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, the very presence of God and the Lamb will be adequate to prevent it. And it was during the absence of God in the Garden of Eden that the tempter came to our first parents. But we are told here that the throne of God and the Lamb are in the New Jerusalem. It's the GHQ, its headquarters for God the Father and God the Son. And the notable absence of any reference to the Holy Spirit does need some explanation. You see, in the first creation, the Holy Spirit came after the fall to renovate and renew the blighted earth. The Spirit of God brooded over the face of the waters. And he is the instrument today of regeneration in the heart and life of sinners. Now, there'll be no need of his work in the new creation in this connection. And therefore, the silence of God at this point is eloquent. And his servant shall do him service. Now, it reveals that heaven's not a place of unoccupied idleness but a place of ceaseless activity. It'll not be necessary to rest in order to give the body an opportunity to recuperate. And the word for service here is a very peculiar word. Dr. Vincent calls our attention to it that it came to be used by the Jews in a very special sense to denote the service rendered to Jehovah by the Israelites as his peculiar people. And you find that over in Hebrews, the ninth chapter, verse 1. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service in a worldly sanctuary. Then down in verse 6 of that same chapter, Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle accomplishing the service of God. You see, this is going to be a peculiar service to God that you and I will perform in eternity. What it is, I don't know. I think that He may give us charge of universes. I think there'll be ceaseless activity. There's no night, and man will at last fulfill his destiny and satisfy the desires of his heart. And man will at last see his face. This was the supreme desire voiced by Moses in the Old Testament and Philip in the New Testament. It's the highest objective for living. What divine satisfaction is going to be there? and each person will bear the name of Christ. Each will be like him, yet without disturbing his own peculiar personality. I've always said this facetiously. It could be true, but I've said that one of the things I want God to do, if he'll do it, is to let me teach the Bible. I want to attend the classes Paul teaches, then I'd like to teach a group of people that were members of my churches that I served on earth but wouldn't come to the midweek Bible study. I've asked for them for one million years, and they won't think it's heaven for that first million years, I'll tell you that, because I'm really going to work them. They're going to have to catch up. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But I do say that we're all going to be busy there. Now our attention is called in this section to the direct lighting of the new creation. There'll be no light holders such as the sun or reflectors such as the moon. God lights the universe by his presence, for God is light. Now it's in eternity that the church will reign with Christ. Who knows but what he'll give to each saint a world 
or a solar system or a galactic system to operate. Remember that Adam was given dominion over the old creation on this earth. Now, verses 6 and 7, we see the promise of the return of Christ. Verses 6 through 16. And he said unto me, These words are faithful and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. And behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the words of the prophecy of this book. Now, the important thing to note here is that he says, Behold, I come quickly. And that means rapidly. And that is repeated again in verse 12 and then again in verse 20. Three times now at the end, Behold, I come not shortly or immediately or soon even. But what he's saying is these events that we have been looking at in Revelation, beginning with chapter 4, take place in a period of not more than seven years, and most of them are confined to the last three and a half years. Now, the encouragement is the Lord Jesus said this is not going to be a long period. I'm coming shortly. I'll soon be there. And that's when you get to this period. We are not exactly accurate when we say the soon coming of Christ. And I'm sure I've used that a thousand times, but I don't think it's an accurate term at all. And it gives the wrong impression, by the way. Now, the Lord Jesus here puts his own seal upon this book and the words are faithful and true. And I think it means that no man is to trifle with them, but spiritualizing them or reducing them to meaningless symbols. He's talking about reality. And you remember at the beginning of this book, there was a blessing pronounced upon those reading here. Now, in conclusion, the Lord Jesus repeats the blessing upon those who keep these words, you see. And that's the important thing. Now, in verses 8 through 11, and I read hurriedly, and I, John, am he that heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel that showed me these things. And he saith unto me, See, do it not. I am a fellow servant with thee and with thy brethren the prophets and with them that keep the words of this book. Worship God. And he saith unto me, Seal not up the words of the prophecy of this book. For the time is at hand. He that is unrighteous, let him do unrighteousness still. He that is filthy, let him be made filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him do righteousness still. And he that is holy, let him be made holy still. Now, this is tremendous. This is John's final and oft-repeated statement that he was both auditor and spectator to the scenes in this book. And this is the method that was put down at the very opening of the book. And this, therefore, is the first TV program John saw and John heard. Now, he was so impressed that his natural reaction was to fall down and worship the angel. And the simplicity and meekness of the angel here, it's impressive. Though the angels were created above man, this angel identifies himself as a fellow servant with John and the other prophets. He was merely a messenger to communicate God's word to man, and he directs all worship to God. Christ is the centerpiece to the book of Revelation. Don't lose sight of him. And he's told here not to seal this. Now, Daniel was told to seal his book. Why? Well, the things that he mentioned were always a long ways off. In fact, we haven't even got to the 70th week of Daniel yet. But now, the book of Revelation... Don't seal it because we are already in that church period in chapters 2 and 3 somewhere and where I don't know, but there seems to be a lot of folk today that seem to know more than I know, and that bothers me a great deal. You'll notice here something else, and this, I think, is the most frightful thing that's been said in this book, and we've had some strong statements, and it's let him that's filthy be filthy still. May I say to you, the condition of the loss gets worse and worse in eternity until each becomes a monster of sin, and this thought is frightful. On the other hand, neither is the condition of the servant of God static. They will continue to grow in righteousness and holiness. Heaven is not static. Even in the millennium of the increase of his kingdom, there shall be no end. 
What a glorious and engaging prospect this should be for the child of God. We shall have all eternity to grow and to know. And believe me, I'm going to need eternity to learn something and how wonderful it'll be. Now he says again here in verse 12, Behold, I come quickly. My reward is with me to render to each man according as his work is. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are they that wash their robes in order that there shall be authority over the tree of life and may enter by the gates into the city without are the dogs and the sorcerers, fornicators, the murderers, the idolaters, and every one that loveth and maketh a lie. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David the bright, the morning star. Now, the church should know this program of God, you see. Now, the angel is bearing a very personal word from Jesus, or else Jesus is breaking through and saying it personally. He promises that he's coming again. This is his personal declaration. No believer can doubt or deny this all-important and personal promise of the Lord Jesus, and he'll personally reward each believer individually, the church at the rapture, and Israel and the Gentiles at his return to set up his kingdom at the millennium. Little wonder that Paul could say, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, I'm reaching forth unto those things which are before I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And again, the Lord Jesus asserts his deity here. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He said that at the beginning of Revelation. He concludes with, and only blood-washed believers have authority over the tree of life and access to the holy city. Dogs come off rather badly in Scripture, as you've noted. We've talked about that before. They were scavengers down here in that day, and the term is used for Gentiles quite a few places, by the way. Now, the Lord Jesus had sent his angel with this very personal message, I, Jesus, and he takes the name of his Saviorhood, the name he received when he took upon himself humanity, the name that no man knows but he himself, and you and I are going to spend eternity just centering on him, his person. And my friend, if you're not interested in Jesus today, I don't know why you'd want to go to heaven because that's all they're going to talk about up there. They're going to talk about him. And he's called here the root and offspring of David. That connects him with the Old Testament. But he's the bright morning star to the church. And do you notice the bright morning star always appears at the darkest time of the night? And it appears and indicates that the sun will be coming up shortly. And in the Old Testament, it ended that the sun of righteousness will arise with healing in his wings. That's the Old Testament hope. But to us, he's the bright morning star and will come at a very dark moment. Now, we have the final invitation and warning here in verses 17 and 19. The spirit and the bride say, come. That's the church. The invitation goes out today. He that heareth, let him say, come. And he that is a thirst, let him come. This is a twofold invitation, an invitation to Christ to come, an invitation to sinners to come to Christ before he comes. He that will, let him take the water of life freely. I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto them. God shall add the plagues which are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the tree of life and out of the holy city which are written in the book. Now the Holy Spirit is in the world today, and he joins in the prayer of the church that says, Lord Jesus, come, come. The Holy Spirit is performing his work in the world today of convicting and converting man. We know that now in the five-year program of the Through the Bible ministry. He works through the Word and through the church which proclaims his Word. And the invitation is to come to man to take the water of life. Everyone that thirsteth, let him come without money and without price. And Jesus stood and said, If any man thirst, 
Let him come unto me and drink. That's the invitation that goes out today. And if you are tired of drinking at the cesspools of this world, he invites you to come. What an invitation this is to come to him. Now, the final promise in prayer, verse 20 and 21. He who testifieth these things saith, yea, I come quickly. Not soon. But when these things begin to come to pass, he's even at the door then. Come, Lord Jesus. And that should be the prayer of every believer today. And the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with all his saints. And we sure need plenty of the grace of God. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind. But now, I see. Well, this is it, the final message in the five-year series. We began this hard-to-believe ninth journey of the Bible bus back in 2011, 60 months and over 1,300 daily broadcasts ago. And we looked at 66 books, 1,189 chapters, and over 31,000 verses in the Bible. And to help us kind of look back on these last five years, I've asked Greg Harris the president of Through the Bible, to join me in studio today so that we can just take a look back and also a look forward. Steve, it's really uh, something special, isn't it? It's an honor for us to be sitting here celebrating God's faithfulness, yes, to this ministry, but to his word. Right. I mean, 45 years of uninterrupted broadcasting, of simply teaching the Bible cover to cover, something that many people say would never attract an audience. Never would work. Yeah. And yet here we are, celebrating this ninth cycle, looking forward to the 10th right. cycle. We can also reflect back that Dr. McGee went to heaven in 1988, mm-hmm. and this ministry has not only continued to survive, it has it's thrived, it, it's grown. We've almost tripled the number of foreign languages. We've yeah. developed so many new technologies. And one of the things, you hear me say this all the time because you're a board member and I often tell the board of directors, as I get to travel around, almost every Christian I meet has a J. Vernon McGee story. Absolutely. The, the influence and the, the effect of this ministry around this country and even around the world is really just staggering. Right. And I know that most of the time when you come in to talk about the broadcast, we're talking about foreign languages and the way we're going into new areas. But we really hope in this time of reflection, looking back on these last five years, that, that you've grown in your walk with the Lord spiritually, that you have a better understanding of Scripture, that you see Jesus Christ in the Old Testament the way Dr. McGee brings him out, and that you've read some of the lesser-read books and studied some of the lesser-read books of the Bible that, that most people just gloss over. We hope that you've been blessed by that. And Steve, you're right. We usually talk to each other, but it is a privilege for us to speak to our listeners because we want to say you are very precious to us. This is why we do what we do. And when we see your pictures in the Bible Bus album or we hear your stories and and your sense of humor and the joy and the depth of transformation in your life, that's the reward. I know we want heavenly reward, but boy, that's all the reward we need. And we're doing this for you. And we also do it for millions of people around the world. And we're just so glad that you have been participating in such a a great endeavor, the study of the entire Word of God. And I look forward to the letters that we're going to get, to the now the senior section that's getting smaller on the Bible bus that's listened, you know, for nine trips, and they're now going on their 10th trip. Mm -hmm. So 50 years of listening to Through the Bible, what a wonderful opportunity that is. And to the letter from, you know, the homeschooling five- or six-year-old who's writing their first letter and saying they enjoy the theme song and listening to Dr. McGee teach. I'm looking forward to all of that. And to one day, all of us being able to see each other in heaven. I mean, how glorious is that going to be? Well, and Steve... I know that you are a Sunday school teacher and that you teach young kids. You have a heart for bringing the Word of God into young kids' lives. You and I are both fathers, and what's closer to our hearts than that our children walk in the truth of the Word of God? Everywhere we look in the ministry of Through the Bible, we see blessing and we see joy. And uh, I agree with you. When we look forward to heaven and meeting each other, and I know lots of people tell us they can't wait to meet Dr. McGee in heaven, Uh, but I'm looking forward to meeting our fellow travelers on the Bible bus, not only here in North America, but from every tribe, tongue, and nation. Right. Greg, this has been great. So let's let's wrap it up, and let's, I think it's appropriate to have Dr. McGee pray on this last uh, broadcast of our five-year series. 
Now here's Dr. McGee with the final prayer in our five-year series. Shall we look to God in prayer? Heavenly Fathers, we look back over the five years. We thank you for what you've done in many hearts. We thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit in bringing conviction of sin and bringing many to Christ, and then of giving a new lifestyle to multitudes of church members. And, oh God, we pray you'll do it again as we begin the new five-year program. Bless each one listening in. And may this book have drawn us close to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. May we see him as he is King of kings and Lord of lords, the one who's altogether lovely, the chiefest among 10,000. We pray in his name. Amen. This program's been brought to you by the faithful friends and supporters of the worldwide ministry of Through the Bible Radio Network.